I pray that you're well on today. This is Pastor Hagwood, pastor of First Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church in Charlotte, North Carolina, where we are exalting Christ to restore, renew, and rebuild people to serve the kingdom of God. Thank God for you on this morning and for those that will be joining us. This is our Sunday school hour. Um, one to start a little bit later uh, on today. Uh, first of all, before I go any further, happy Palm Sunday to everyone. This is Palm Sunday. Uh, next Sunday will be our Resurrection Sunday, and of course this week will be our Passion Week leading up to Resurrection Sunday. And I wanted to just uh, wish everyone a, again a happy uh, Palm Sunday on today. For those who don't know what Palm Sunday is, uh, this is the this is the, the Sunday that commemorates the entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem uh, during Passover, uh, and this begins the trek toward the cross uh, of Calvary uh, during this week. And so today commemorates that, and normally we commemorate that with palm leaves. And you can read this in the Gospels. Um, I don't have the scriptures in front of me right now, but um, you can read this in the Gospels in regards to. Jesus actually uh, coming in on a coat um, or a donkey, if you will, who came into Jerusalem um, and they began to lay uh, their cloaks uh, as he came down the roadside and, and in, into, into Jerusalem. And uh, for those who did not have cloaks, they began to grab palm leaves uh, off the trees and began to actually place them before Jesus' feet. Um, and the colt's feet as the, as the, as he um, was being uh, carried on the back of a donkey during the course of um, that entry um, into Jerusalem. And so, um, uh, again, um, this is when they began to say, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed be the one who comes in the name of the Lord, uh, the one who will save us, okay? Uh, and so with that uh, begins the process of uh, the Passion Week and leading all the way up into the crucifixion of Christ and then also the resurrection of Jesus Christ um, uh, three days later after that point. So I just want to wish you all a happy Palm Sunday on today. And um, we're going to go right into our lesson uh, today, which is on the prophet Elijah. And this is Elijah, the prophet of courage. Elijah, the prophet of courage. So let's have a word of prayer very quickly before we get into our lesson today. And for all those that will be joining or watching, please feel free to share this. Um, share this with uh, folks, on, folks on your page, pages on Facebook and so forth. Uh, Pastor does not mind. Just want to make sure that the word of God goes out to everyone um, in order that they may be blessed by it, be encouraged by it, and be led uh, and instructed in a much better way according to the work um, and will and purpose of Jesus Christ, our Lord. So let us pray at this time. Father God, we thank you and praise you, Lord, for today. Thank you, Lord, for this time that we're in right now in regards to your word uh, and studying your word on uh, this Sunday morning. We ask, Lord, that you meet us in this place and allow your glory, O oh God, to uh, be around us, O oh Lord, inside of us, uh, surround this place in the virtual space so that, Lord, we not only just get through the lesson, but more importantly, oh Lord, that we gather from the lesson instructions that we can live our lives more according to you. Thank you for all that you continue to do. Bless us now and keep us in every way. We ask this prayer in the name of Jesus the Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. So with that said, I want to get into our lesson today. Again, Elijah, prophet of change, or excuse me, prophet of courage, prophet of courage, and um, as I go through, I'm going to go through our aim for change. Our scripture is 1 Kings chapter number 18, verses 5 through 18. Let me read that again. 1 Kings 18, uh, verses 5 through 18. And our aim for change reads this way. It says, by the end of this lesson, we will compare Elijah's response to speak to Ahab uh, to that of Obadiah's response to report back to Ahab. Gain a sense of Obadiah's concerns when reporting Elijah's message to Ahab and act in boldness when speaking the word of God. And so our end focus goes this way, and it says, When Chris fled her abusive husband, she vowed never to depend on another human. She packed her bags and drove across the country to a new job in a strange new town. She worked hard, and at the end of the day, she would sit down with a cup of tea, and a book. 
She went to church, but the closest she ever got to anyone was uh, to Mandy, a single mother living in the same apartment complex. She would nod at Mandy as they passed each other in the halls and quickly turn away with a polite little cough. As the weeks went by, the polite cough became serious and a throbbing pain settled in her chest. The violence, uh, violence she suffered had taken a toll. A series of contradictory doctors discouraged her and slowly uh, her apartment and solitary life started falling into disarray. Mandy met her one day as she was catching her breath on the stairs. Hey, Chris, want a uh, hand with, your, with those groceries? No, thanks, actually. Uh, actually, yes, that would be great. She accepted Mandy's help, but hesitated a bit to let her into the chaos her apartment had become. Chris rested on the couch, and Mandy cooked dinner for them. I see where you're coming from, said Mandy, after hearing Chris's story. But shutting yourself off from other people isn't the best way to go. God made us to be part of a community. And that means sharing your struggles with other people and listening to their advice. Chris nodded. I, see, I can see that now. I thought I'd be safer by myself, but it looks like that wasn't to be. And then the question here asks, whom could you reach out to for advice and for help? And so, again, in the community of faith of the church, we must understand that um, the church should always be not only perceived, but the reality must be lived, that it is a safe haven. It is a place that people can come, come and feel comfortable and feel safe, okay? They shouldn't feel like they're being judged. They shouldn't feel like, um, like the world is coming up against them when they come into God's house. For truly, as we think about even Christ, think about every moment of Christ's ministry on earth, uh, I pick out one specifically where Jesus tells the woman who was caught in the act of adultery, which I'm still trying to figure out where the dude was in the midst of all that. But um, when he tells the people, he says, those who out sin cast the first stone. And for those who grabbed rocks, they had to drop them. They could not throw them because of the simple fact that they knew in their heart that they were of a sinful nature. And so they couldn't accuse someone else of sin knowing that they, they themselves uh, uh, are sinful. So they dropped their rocks, walked away. And so Jesus asked the question, of course, uh, to the woman, where are your accusers? And she says, I have none. She looked around and says, I have none. And the next thing he says, he says, I do not accuse you either. Go and sin no more. And so, again, the church community is not a place of being on trial under jurisprudence um, and accusation um, for someone to point the finger at you um, and to judge you knowing they themselves aren't perfect. So I, I think that when we get to that place, again, where can you reach out for help, for advice, various places you can go. Um, you know, I, I, am a, I am a pastoral counselor, um, but I am not a clin clinician, um, clinical counselor. So because of that, um, I, I, I know there's only cert a certain amount of counseling that I can do up to a certain point um, where if there's a deeper issue or deeper problem, it may require someone uh, who has expertise in that area specifically. However, it doesn't mean that someone can't come to me or the pastor or someone in the church and we can lead them appropriately to the resources that they need. Okay, it, it, it's important that we understand that you cannot live life alone. Okay, I, 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 let's be clear on that before we get really into deeper into the lesson. You, you cannot live your life by yourself. Okay, the reason why I say that is because, or at least you can live your life that way, but you'll be by yourself. And it's very unhealthy, to be honest with you, because if you don't have a community of faith or community around you, a family around you, and so forth, it'll be very, it's very difficult if something happens to you. Say you get sick. Say that you're at home and you fall uh, and get hurt and you, you need someone to help you because you can't help yourself. It, it's, um, I know that's an extreme case, but... Um, 
uh, when you're dealing with something that is uh, downtrodden you, that's really uh, got you weighed down, uh, if you're dealing with bereavement and death, um, there's something in your spirit that makes you slow down. So you need folks around you that can encourage you and build you up and, and give you uh, necessary, not only help, but more importantly, the love and extension and community that you need in order to connect uh, one with another. I, that's why I believe truly why we, why, why God made it clear that we never should shun the aspect of the church community because of the gathering together, because all of us need each other in some way, shape, fashion, or form. I, I was at First Mount Zion uh, at our, the church that I pastor uh, yesterday, and on Saturday, especially during this pandemic, what you'll find is that you'll have members that will come through, and um, some people are coming to get their tithes and offerings. We have a lot of things going on still at the church during the pandemic, uh, things that we're working on. Um, um, if you're a member of First Mount Zion, and you have not been back to the church for a while because of the pandemic, uh, come, come by on a Saturday. Um, usually around one o'clock, um, you'll, you'll see a host of things that are going on in your church that we're still working on in the midst of the pandemic. Uh, it's going to surprise you when you come back into that sanctuary, how it's going to look. Um, I'm not going to give much more to that, but there's some things that we're working on, um, because the church is not dead. The church is not closed. The church is alive. So, um, so we're still working, you know. Uh, in regards to the church. And I think that what you will find is that there is a greater still sense of community within our gathering, okay? Um, I had members come up to me yesterday that were concerned because uh, they knew that I was dealing with bereavement. Also, um, they were concerned uh, for my well-being because they they see how much I'm pouring out, okay, with regards to studies and sermons since the pandemic. And many pastors are in this same boat where, uh, we are physically tired, and uh, my my schedule uh, of things that I've got going on, um, from a doctoral program to um, about being a vocational pastor, it, it's a lot. It's quite a bit in my family, you know, my wife and my children. It's a lot that's there. But the reality is that um, sometimes it takes a community around you to be able to say, Pastor, are you okay? Do you need to slow down some? You might need to slow down a little bit. Let's take some of this off of your plate and, and, and we'll handle it uh, and so forth. And it's good to be in a community of faith like that because, again, you, it tells you, one, that you're not alone. Not only with God, that God said he would never leave you nor forsake you, but I also believe that when he said that, it wasn't just from the standpoint that he said he wouldn't leave you nor forsake you, but that he would place other people around you to make you feel that same love of God. Because he created those same people in his image, in his own image. And because of that, we are never alone. That's why it's so important to be a part of a community of faith. And you can, we can reach out to one another, uh, get advice from one another in a confidential manner, and to be able to help one another along this journey of life. Because it all truly centers back towards the love of Jesus Christ that he has for us. And because of that, that like-mindedness that we have when we come together in the midst of the gathering uh, of, of being the church, um, we end up finding a community where we can be strengthened uh, on a daily walk because this walk of life is not, uh, it's not uh, easy. It, it can be difficult at times. And this is why it's important to have the connection pieces um, um, and be able to seek help and seek advice and be a part of a spiritual community. Um, I am big on church. I'm just big on it uh, because I believe, that, and the reason why is for me, I'm, I'm so, uh, it, it's so paramount in my life because from the time I was small, uh, time I was eight, nine years old, I just saw how church helped me. Okay, I look back at it now and for every other place I possibly could have been, it was good that I was at Sunny Home Baptist Church in Eden, North Carolina, that we had a community of faith there, that literally we did so much stuff together. And um, no one ever felt alone. And when you're living in a smaller town, it's even much tighter, okay? And, and that uh, church community even, you know, helps mold. Um, I can think of all types of events that we did, you know, from Sunday school trips, um, um, with um, 
our superintendent of Sunday school at that time. Uh, he was then Deacon Arnold, uh, Arnold Wilkinson, but now uh, he's, a, he's um, a minister of the gospel, uh, Minister Wilkinson, and uh, him directing. We're going to Carolines and going to King's Dominion up, uh, up on the other side of Richmond, Virginia, and places of that nature. And it was just awesome to be able to do that and be in a community of faith that, we're, that we were tied to. Um, um, many of my, of course, childhood friends and things of that nature and their parents, we were all part of this community. Uh, of faith and uh, many of my most fondest memories um, um, in my childhood go back to St. Home Baptist Church uh, and not only my spiritual growth but just the community, the community of faith and that's important that's important to be able to have because as life goes on and as all, life has its vicissitudes and it changes and moves back and forth, what type of community are we a part of? Is it a healthy community? Is it a healthy spiritual community to get advice from in order to be able to be healthy spiritually and emotionally as we walk uh, through life and as we deal with the challenges that life presents, but know that we have a God that is much larger and much bigger than any challenge that we could ever face. So that's something that we can uh, uh, always keep in mind. Remember, um, uh, to the one who's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ever ask or think according to his power that works in us. That's Jesus. That's God. And and that's Ephesians 3 and 20. So uh, you can read that for yourself. But it's good to be a part of a community of faith. Because again, it ties in a community where we can come together in love, in kindness, in the spirit of God and continue to be led by the spirit in order to be able to be, be positioned better in life and to help one another along the journey. Amen. Um, the keep in mind scripture is this, is I have made no trouble for Israel, Elijah replied. You and your family are troublemakers, for you have refused to obey the commands of the Lord and have worshipped the images of Baal instead. That is 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 18. And so now I want to get into the background here uh, of what we're going to talk about today uh, in 1 Kings. Um, what we have here is literally a setup where uh, one of the bad kings, bad kings of Israel, um, his name was King Ahab. Uh, Ahab was going through the process of looking for the prophet Elijah, okay? And uh, Elijah was one of the prophets of that time. And also Obadiah, who was a prophet at that time, uh, who was under, um, under King, uh, King Ahab uh, and was basically, um, you know, a servant for King Ahab, even though K King Ahab was a rebellious king against God. So the setup is this, in this lesson, is that... Um, for about three and a half years, King Ahab had been looking for Elijah, and not looking for him in a in a in a gesture in a in a good gesture way. He was looking for him in order to possibly kill him, okay? Um, because he blamed Elijah for what he called the curse. What he called the curse that Elijah. Say Elijah had placed on the land for not receiving any rain, okay, and not receiving any um, any nourishment, of course, from from the weather uh, for the land in order for the grass to grow. One of the problems that Ahab had was that many of his horses and and chariots, for the horses specifically, for his chariots, um, they were starting to get weak. And the reason why, because they couldn't eat, okay? There was a drought in the land, which Ahab had blamed Elijah for. There's a drought in the land. The animals can't eat, so the horses are getting weak. And if you got weak horses, the chariots mean nothing without strong horses. So that means that a level of military protection could not happen because the horses were weak because there was no food due to the drought, which Ahab blamed Elijah for. Okay, so the whole point of this is that in our lesson is that 
now Ahab had gotten to the point with Obadiah and said, you know what? I'm going to go one way to go look for Elijah. And Obadiah, you go the other way. And we got to find him. Okay? Because again, Ahab had blamed him for the curse. Now, I also set this up from the perspective of Ahab being bad king. Okay? Ahab had married uh, married a Phoenician woman by the name of Jezebel. We all know that word and they know that name uh, because we probably mentioned it so many times over to other people and they have said it probably in judgment um, wrongly against women, unfortunately, and said that somebody's a Jezebel or what have you. That's where they get it from. They get it from actually Ahab's wife because her name was Jezebel. Now, Jezebel was an act, act, the aspect of her living. She was a worshiper of Baal. She was a worshiper, worshiper of a false god. And she had basically coaxed Ahab into worshiping Baal as well. Now, the worshipers of Baal, Baal was a false god, false god of basically rain and dew, okay? Which is very oxymoronic or contradictory, if you will, when you really think about it. That why would Ahab be blaming, <laughs> blaming Elijah for not having any rain when he is worshiping, supposed to be worshiping a god that controls the rain and dew? Okay, so you see how false worship can get you misinformed in regards to what you're seeing or, or how you're visioning various things uh, spiritually um, when you think. You're not doing anything wrong and you actually are and so that worship of Baal um, again was not looked favorably upon of course by God and God made it a point for the land not to get any rain okay and of course Ahab blames Elijah for it from the simple fact that um, Elijah was very bold in calling out Ahab and calling out his indiscretions and this is where a large part of the issue comes in with regards to the lesson that we're in, because now it's so much of a drought that now they can't defend themselves because of what I just stated before. So what ends up what ends up happening is that there's now uh, the search for Elijah. Okay, they're looking for him. Okay, they're looking for him, and Obadiah has truly the spirit of God in a very mild and, and tender sense. And um, eventually, what ends up happening is that. He comes to the place of finding him. And this is where our scripture kind of begins uh, on today. And, and Obadiah actually finding, in uh, um, Obadiah finding Elijah. And then this aspect of conversation, if you will, between Ahab and Elijah begins to ensue. Okay. So with that, let me read the background from our commentator. And for those that are joining us, uh, we have about 20 folks on. That's great. Um, pre Precepts for Living. This is the book that we use at First Mountain Zion by the Urban Ministries Institute. Uh, this is our Sunday school book. Um, we have been using this book uh, even before I got to First Mountain Zion as the pastor. Uh, but I knew of this material. It is a very good uh, book, especially in African-American churches, regardless of the denomination. Um, does a very good job. Um, the, um, the editor here, I think his name is Eugene, no, Melvin E. Banks, Dr. Melvin E. Banks. He does an awesome job. Um, they just do an awesome job with regards to Sunday school lessons. This is what we use as our Sunday school lesson, Precepts for Living. And this, of course, is the edition for 20, uh, for 2020, 2021, um, that we, that we're using. So just wanted to show that to you. Um, the background goes this way from, from the commentator. Since God's law clearly commanded never to, to worship false gods. In Exodus 20 and 3, Deuteronomy 5 and 7. Uh, not to invoke their names, um, that's in Exodus 23 and 13. Not to marry their adherents or practice any of their customs. Leviticus 20 and 23, 2 Kings 17 and 15. King Ahab violated, King Ahab violated each one of these laws during his 22-year reign in Israel. He married Jezebel, a Phoenician Baal worshiper who had altars and a temple built for Baal. 
This false god of rain and dew was the supreme male deity of the ancient Phoenicians and Canaanites. Their rituals included illicit, illicit sex, ritual prostitution, and child sacrifice. God's prophet Elijah confronted King Ahab. The first, uh, the first time scripture mentions him, he appears before King Ahab announcing the drought to come upon the whole land because of the nation's sin. This is why Ahab blamed him. Okay, remember, all Elijah's doing is telling what the Lord told him and telling it to the people. But of course, in most cases, it's the messenger that gets fired upon because of the word that God has spoken through him. So uh, that's in 1 Kings uh, chapter 17, verses 1 through 7. This one verbal threat by a lone prophet of God challenged the worship of Baal, who was supposed to control the rain. You see, that's what I said, said before. Um, instead of Ahab and Jezebel acknowledging God and repenting, they were furious. They desperately sent out soldiers to hunt for Elijah, to force him to reverse this curse, okay? As if Elijah was the one who put, put a curse on them. No, God did that. So again, they're looking for him to actually to try to force him to reverse what God has already instituted, okay? And the question here says, how have you pushed back against God instead of acknowledging him and repenting him? Oh, uh, we, we could go for years and 10,000 lifetimes over this one. Because again, um, oftentimes we, we, we have this level of rebellion against God against doing God's will, doing it God's way. And this is why we have to consistently ask for forgiveness uh, for sins of omission and commission. Omission meaning those sins that we knew we did and we knew it was sin. And even those of commission that we didn't realize that were, was sin, but we, in hindsight, we realize, okay, we probably sinned against God and maybe someone else in regards to, you know, in regards to what we said or did. So this is why it's important that... Um, um, we understand how have we pushed back on God because at the end of the day we're, we're trying to fall in line with the order of what God wants us or how he wants us to live and what that means for us is that there is a lot of, a lot of challenge that God places really in front of us with regards to what he's instructed it's not to cause the aspect of restriction it's really there to protect us and when we do it God's way, what we find is, is that doing it his way, we end up finding a path. I'm not going to say it's always pleasant, because there may be struggle and sacrifice that goes through it. But we, what we will find is that at the end of it, we would definitely be much better off than we were if we would have tried to do it our own way or to do it uh, a way that's against God, which is literally Satan's mode, uh, a way of, uh, of sin which we should not be participating or doing things in. We should be doing things according to God's standard and how he has set um, precepts up in order for us to uh, obey his instruction so that we walk favorably in life and we find ourselves. And again, it doesn't mean that you're not going to have struggle because you, you, you will have uh, trials and tribulations of all kinds. And so with that, um, there's a lot of things that will come, but if we do it God's way, even with the struggles and the sacrifices that we deal with, we will find at the end of it, it's definitely going to be much better off for us and that God already had that plan and position before um, we even uh, would recognize uh, our obedience to what he was telling us to do. Okay, if we do that, we do that and walk in his statutes and way, ways, I, I would guarantee you that on the, in the back end of it, we would definitely be much better off than we were if we would have tried to go our own way, okay? So with that being said, uh, this is why it's so important that we repent to God. Uh, we ask for forgiveness daily. I think this is one of the reasons why the Lord's Prayer, why he set it up uh, this way. And why he told his disciples to pray this way. Um, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So that means that forgive us for our sins and our transgressions because we're not perfect. And because of that, we need to keep 
ourselves in due bounds with God because of the simple fact that even when we're saved, we still have the potential to sin. So with regards to that, that gives the aspect of covering of us acknowledging the aspect of our propensity to sin and also the, the, uh, the reality that we do sin. But to place that back before God, to ask God for forgiveness of it so that we are back in line and in order to his statutes, his will, and his way. And we are led by way of the Holy Spirit to doing and performing um, the instruction of God the way God has asked. That's why, again, we're not perfect. We serve a perfect God. That's why we yield to God and yield to his instruction because we are dependent upon that in order to lead him healthy lives spiritually okay um let's go a little further let's go into the scripture itself on, on today uh, i'm going to do a real quick check-in um 30 minutes in let me see who's out there um sister modestine uh tidwell justine wilson sister melissa adams sister judy ware uh sister prudence wilkes uh brother will clark hope you well sir sister anita jackson best uh sister darlene pegram um, you're welcome, Sister Pegan, for those scriptures last week. Uh, I pray that they definitely help. Um, uh, help again in the conversation that you had with your your coworker, um, Deacon Eddie Scott, Sister Mildred Scott, Sister Doyle Fair, um, Sister Francine Bailey, Deacon um, Clark, uh, Deacon Marion Clark, Sister Teresa Reed, Sister Georgia Springs, uh, and Sister Joan Joan uh, McCall Trapp. I pray that you are well uh, on today. Um, all of everyone that's here uh, uh, looking at us via online, we thank God for your presence on today. Let me keep going further into our lesson today. Um, 1 Kings 18, this is our scripture. 1 Kings 18, verses 5 through 18. Um, let me make sure I got that right. Yeah, 5 through 18. So I'm going to start, I'm going to read through the scripture, and then we're going to break this down over the next 30 minutes or so. From the New Living Translation, it reads this way. Ahab said to Obadiah, we must check every spring and valley in the land to see if we can find enough grass to save at least some of my horses and mules. So they divided the land between them. Ahab went one way by himself, and Obadiah went another way by himself. As Obadiah was walking along, he suddenly saw Elijah coming toward him. Obadiah recognized him at once, bowed low to the ground before him. Is it really you, my Lord Elijah? He asked. Yes, it is, Elijah replied. Now go and tell your master. Elijah is here. Oh, sir, Obadiah protested. What harm have I done to you that you are sending me to my death at the hands of Ahab? For I swear by the Lord your God that the king has searched every nation and kingdom on the earth from, uh, from end to end to find you. And each time he was told, Elijah isn't here. King Ahab forced the king of that nation to swear uh, to the truth of this claim. And now you say, go and tell your master, Elijah is here. But as soon as I leave you, the spirit of the Lord will carry you away to who knows where. When Ahab comes and cannot find you, he will kill me. Yet I have been a true servant of the Lord all my life. Has no one told you, my Lord, about the time when Jezebel was trying to kill the Lord's prophets? I hid 100 of them in two caves and supplied them with food and water. And now you say, go and tell your master, Elijah, is here. Sir, if I do that, Ahab will certainly kill me. But Elijah said, I swear by the Lord Almighty in whose presence I stand, that I will present myself to Ahab this very day. So Obadiah went to tell Ahab that Elijah had come, and Ahab went out to meet Elijah. And when Ahab saw him, he exclaimed, So is it really you, you troublemaker, troublemaker of Israel? I have made no trouble for Israel, Elijah replied. You and your family are the troublemakers, for you have refused to obey the commands of the Lord and have worshipped the images of Baal. In his hand. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his holy word. So let us deal with verses 5 through 8 at this time. Again, Ahab said to Obadiah, we must check every spring and valley in the land to see if we can find enough grass 
to save at least some of my horses and mules. So they divided the land between them. Ahab went one way by himself. Obadiah went another way by himself. As Obadiah was walking along, he suddenly saw Elijah coming toward him. Obadiah recognized him at once, bowed low to the ground before him. Is it really you, my Lord Elijah? He asked. So we see the positioning here of what God does. This drought that they're in has now caused a search not only for grass, okay, for the horses and mules, but specifically for Elijah, okay? So because of the move of not having, not having grass, I'm going to stay right there right now, for not having grass for the mules and horses, has now caused Ahab and Obadiah to go out and search for the one who gave the proclamation message saying that there would be a drought in the land. They attribute the drought to Elijah, even though they were told that they were told by Elijah that God was the one who said that they would go through the process uh, of having a drought because of their disobedience. So instead of looking at themselves as the reason why the drought is happening, specifically Ahab, they want to blame the messenger. They want to blame Elijah. And they know that uh, God was the one who ordered, ordered it. Elijah was just the messenger, but because he was the one who said it, and now the drought has happened, they're blaming him. When Elijah specifically told them that it was because of their disobedience of why the drought was happening, or why the drought came. And I want to circle this for us in the present context for which we live. Have you looked at yourself? Okay, and this is a question you just need to ask yourself. Have you looked at yourself and asked yourself, maybe it's the things that I'm doing is the cause of why I don't feel spiritually refreshed and watered in the day and time that I'm living in right now. Keep this in mind. Because it's very easy to blame the messenger. Okay? You know how many times I as a pastor have been accused of um, saying something against someone when they really weren't on my mind. I was just doing what God told me to do through the message and the word that he had given me. I don't know how God is going to affect that word when it goes out. Only thing I can do is be obedient to what God has given me and to be able to, to expose it and to be able to be an expositor of it and sermonically project it or to teach it in order to help us. Because sometimes aid and help for us hurts. It hurts sometimes, but not hurting to the point of death. Hurting to the point that says in your inner spirit, there is something wrong with me internally. The word of God is for us to take in and remember, the word of God is not there to condemn you. It's not there to condemn you. It will bring light to the truth. And as Jesus even told us in the scriptures in John chapter 8, for you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. But the question is, the truth can't set you free unless you're willing to adhere to truth and realize that you're not living in that truth and that there's compromises that your own spirit has with regards to God's truth that we need to realign ourselves back to. And this is why it is so important that when the word of God is projected and taught and preached that we are listening in order to be reformed, in order to be renewed, in order to be restored. This is why it's important. Why it's so important. Again, our business statement for our church, exalting Christ, we lift up Christ to what? To restore, renew, and rebuild. 
because that's what God's word does for us. When we're in a deconstructive state, God's word reconstructs us. But that's only if we allow the brick and mortar of the truth, God's truth, to build us back up. Because it's one thing to hear the word. It's, one, it's another thing to be an adherer of it. A person who obeys it, who lives in it. Two different things. But once that word is spoken, now the responsibility comes on the individual whether or not they wish to obey or disobey that very message. And this is what we're dealing with here is again God's providence over the whole situation. And now they're looking for Elijah. When really maybe they should be looking at themselves. It wasn't Elijah that caused the drought. It was their disobedience to God that caused the drought. And I think sometimes we need to do some introspection for ourselves. Are we the ones causing other people to stumble? Are we the ones causing the spiritual havoc that's going on in our lives? So rather than blaming the Sunday school teacher, rather than blaming the preacher, rather than blaming those who are trying to do it God's way. Maybe we need to look at ourselves and maybe we need to look at the truth which has been projected and to see how our lives are balanced to the aspect of that truth. Because if they're not, then there's some things that we need to make sure that we're doing. And that's across the board. Pulpit, the pew, doesn't matter. Preacher, the congregant, doesn't matter. At the end of the day, we must be challenged by the word of God and adhere to it. Hmm. Let me go a little further here. Commentator writer says it this way is a question I want to deal with. Since filling the effects of the drought, King Ahab and his chief servant Obadiah discussed trying to find grass uh, for the royal horses. The king fears for his safety if his horses died. No army to protect him. Ahab and Obadiah uh, agree to search the area in different directions. As Obadiah calls the area, Elijah, the missing prophet, walks towards him. King Ahab had looked diligently for, diligently, for, diligently for Elijah for three and a half years, determined to force him to revert the drought. The leaders in the surrounding countries joined in the massive hunt for the prophet. No one located him. They swore to the king that no one individual had laid eyes on Elijah. However, by the providence of God, Obadiah and Elijah traveled down the same path. Obadiah recognizes him and bows with his face to the ground in reverence, fear and fear, reverence and respect for God's messenger. And in here it says, when has God caused you to have an unexpected encounter? Well, that's, that's something that we can ask ourselves and think about uh, just based on the channel of life in general, uh, what we will find is that there are various unexpected encounters that we have in life, okay, um, that would prompt us to think about why we had that encounter in the first place. Um, I want you to think about this. Anytime that you have an encounter, any type of encounter, think about this. Especially if it's something that is surprising. After that encounter, I want you to process that. Why did I have this type of encounter? Maybe it was somebody you haven't seen in a while. But maybe the maybe it was something in the conversation. Okay? Because maybe God could have been speaking in the midst of that, in that encounter. So don't don't over uh don't just take for granted or overshoot the conversation. Think about it, especially if it's something you know in your experience, like, that was very interesting. Dig a little deeper into that. Think about that and and, um, and really pray about it because it may be something that God was speaking to you on through someone else who may not have known your situation or what you're going through. Just something that we must keep in mind. Again, 
um, when we have these certain encounters. And Obadiah had this encounter, again, with Elijah. Okay? Let's go to verses 9 through 16. Okay? It says, Oh, sir, Obadiah protested, what harm have I done to you that you are sending me to my death at the hands of Ahab? For I swear by the Lord your God that the king has searched every nation and kingdom on the earth from end to end to find you. And each time he is told, he was told, Elijah isn't here. King Ahab forced the king of that nation to swear the truth of his claim. And now you say, go and tell your master Elijah is here. And, but as soon as I leave you, the spirit of the Lord will carry you away to who knows where. When Ahab comes and cannot find you, he will kill me. Yet I have been a true servant of the, of the Lord all my life. Has no one told you, my Lord, about the time when Jezebel was trying to kill the Lord's prophets? I hid 100 of them in two caves and supplied them with food and water. And now you say, go and tell your master, Elijah is here. Sir, if I do that, Ahab will certainly kill me. But Elijah said, I will swear by the Lord Almighty, in whose presence I stand, that I will present myself to Ahab this very day. So Obadiah went to tell Ahab that Elijah had come, and Ahab went out to meet with to meet with Elijah. Now, what's interesting here is Obadiah is scared to death. He's like, okay, first of all, everybody's been trying to find you, Elijah. And of all people, I was the one that found you. Or we found each other. But if I don't bring you back to Ahab and I tell him that I met with you and saw you, but you refused to meet with him, he is surely going to kill me. Okay? Now, it's interesting here, and I'm going to read what the commentator writer said to deal with this question. Elijah asked Obadiah to deliver a message. He wants, he wants a face-to-face -face meeting with King Ahab. Obadiah responds with excuses. He thinks his master might be suspicious, assuming he knew the prophet's hiding place all this time. Obadiah uh, uh, images an upset king, angry enough to kill him. He also raises another reason for his reluctance. Elijah had a reputation of being in one place and then the Holy Spirit whisking him away to another. Obadiah lacks confidence in Elijah being in this location for a meeting with the king. Obadiah continues giving reasons for refusing Elijah's request. Calls him himself one who truly worships Yahweh since his youth. When Jezebel tried to kill all of God's prophets, Obadiah hid 100 of them in caves, supplying them with food and water. The king's servant urges Elijah to realize how much he'd done already and withdraw his demand. Now, the question here says, when one leader, one's leader, when one's leader is a tyrant, is it better to covertly honor God as Obadiah did or overtly as Elijah did? Now, this is a very good question because what it deals with is this the, the definition of what we would call what is bold, okay? And also it deals with an aspect of the calling of individuals um, because not everyone is called to be overt like Elijah, okay? Uh, in regard to ministering the gospel or, in the, uh, or, or uh, adhering or performing the commands of God. So even with what Obadiah had done previously about hiding the 100 uh, servants of God in caves, giving them food and water, making sure they were taken care of because they knew he knew that Ahab would have had them killed if that wasn't done. So from that perspective, the covert aspect does make sense because if he would have overtly done it, those 100 servants of God would have been killed if Ahab knew where they were, and Obadiah would have been bold about it, um, and overtly bold about it, and said, yeah, I'm hiding them. I'm hiding them in the caves over there. Feeding them water. Y'all can't kill them. And Ahab would have justly tried to 
make it a point to get to those caves and kill those hundred servants of God. So, so in, in regards to this, what Obadiah is doing when he's talking to Elijah, he's telling him, he says, look, yes, I have some fear around this, but I also want you to know that I am one that's been trying to serve God from the very beginning. Um, he knows, I think Obadiah understands and he knows that Ahab is crazy. That Ahab is a tyrant leader. That Ahab has no business sitting at the throne where he sits. That Ahab has no business being the president of a country. I mean, you can take that for whatever, whatever it's worth. But the, he under, I think he understands that. But he also understands the position that he's in to the point where he knows if, if he is in a position where he can actually help to save a lot of folk, save a lot of folk because of what he knows, because he's right there in the king's house. And even though he is he's serving a tyrant leader, it doesn't mean that he himself is a tyrant. So I, I want you to understand this just from the perspective of how we're living today, okay? Um, we may have leaders in our country and cities and nations and states that run themselves as tyrants, as those that are completely discombobulated. They're all over the place, all over the place, and uh, do many things in error, uh, do many things to hurt and harm people. However, that does not mean that you have to take on that adage of what they do because of the position that they're in. Hold true to your integrity. Hold true to your authenticity in God because that's what's keeping you um, truly in perfect peace and also keeping you with the mind that is sober and that's humble to the projection of of what God would have. And maybe God has put you in a place and a position like Esther for such a time as this so that folks can be saved because of the information that you know. It may not be a calling for you to be overt. You may have to be covert. But that doesn't mean that you don't lose your heart. Lose your heart in the midst of someone else being a tyrant. At the end of the day, you're still God's child. And you still profess Yahweh. You still profess God through Jesus Christ. And because of that, you still operate in that manner. Regardless of what's going on in and around the world. And even where you sometimes sit. Because you may sit in a place where you're having to serve someone who has a very deranged mind. Spiritually. And I think that. Everyone is called to different places in different times. So I thank God for the William Bar Reverend William Barbers of the world. I thank God for them because those are the ones that God has placed to challenge everything overtly, to call it out, to go to the state, state capitol and say, hey, this ain't right. This is not right and based off of, uh, of God, God's tie to humanity that we're going to protest it. God has those people in the world and also God has those who are kind of working in the aspect of the government and other places and so forth that have the same mind and also serving the best interests of the kingdom of God but they must do it in a very strategic way. And sometimes that way is covert. It's not overt. It's not open. It's more. It's more behind the scenes. Okay, let me move these figures because if I do this, it's going to allow for these people to have a voice, or these people, in order to be able to not be harmed, if you will, in a certain way. And maybe God has called them to that. So I don't look at it as an either or, being covert or being overt. I think it's more of a matter of what God has. Uh, call certain individuals into and that God's will is being worked on both sides. Hmm. Let's see if there are any questions or comments. We've got a few more minutes and a few more verses that we need to get through. Um,
Sister Springs said, hurt which will convict you to make you acknowledge you're not in order of God's will. Yes, yes, yes. I see what you're saying, Sister Springs. So, um, again, hurt that will convict you to the place of acknowledgement. And this is why I honestly believe when Jesus says that you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free, Sometimes being set free by the truth is really coming to the acknowledgement that we're wrong. Coming to the acknowledgement that we're messed up. Coming to the acknowledgement that we're doing things incorrectly. And then to be brought back into a place where the truth resets uh, our acknowledgement to God, repentance to God, and then also God's redirecting us back on the path of doing things his way and treating people the right way. What's the right way? The right way is God's way. The right way is Christ's way. Okay? Um, we say right, I'm talking about God's righteousness, not our own. Not our own. Great observation, uh, Sister Springs. Let me go um, into these last verses. Uh, Sister Ware just wrote something. Better to be poor and honest than to be dishonest and rich. <laughs> Proverbs 28 and 6. Yeah, it's the book that oftentimes will just hammer um, hammer and hammer that nail uh, right into the wood. Um, better to be poor and honest than to be dishonest and rich. Um, yes, in many respects. And again, that verse doesn't say that you don't have to, um, there's, that there's a sin with having a lot of money. I'm not saying that. It's saying that the aspect of you, of us, all of us, that, um, that there's a level of humility that must come with every, every part of our lives, regardless of what we have materially in this world. So if we have a whole lot of money or riches or resources, that should not preclude us from being humble. We should not be manip manipulative because we have money. We should still be humble and honest. Really, because God has blessed us so in order to be in a position that we're in financially, if we have a lot of money. Uh, and I think that th this is something that oftentimes gets, we think that because or some people would think that because I have all these material riches that there's a certain level of power that I have to do whatever I want to do. That surely isn't of God at all. That humbleness and humility must play itself out regardless of what your state, state of life actually is. Let's read these last two verses and I'm going to go ahead and close out. Um... Verses 17 and 18, when Ahab saw him, he exclaimed, <coughs> excuse me, so is it really you, you troublemaker of Israel? I have made no trouble for Israel, Elijah replied. You and your family are troublemakers, for you have refused to obey the commands of the Lord and have worshipped the image of Baal instead. Wow. So, what we have here, Elijah refrains from the commentator writer, Elijah refrains from addressing Obadiah's fears and hesitations. Instead, he speaks about the mighty God they serve. Elijah walks in, uh, walks in the assurance of God's presence, his shield of protection. He boldly uh, intends to challenge King Ahab, resting in the sovereignty of God. He promises Obadiah that when King Ahab arrives, uh, he will be in that very spot Obadiah, uh, very spot. Obadiah never says another word to Elijah, but proceeds to go and arrange the meeting. Finally, Ahab and Elijah face each other. The king accuses Elijah of being one, uh, the one that disturbed and destroyed his kingdom with the drought. He speaks correct. He, he speaks correctly. Elijah had made the no rain declaration, just a declaration, though. However, Elijah places the responsibility right back on Ahab's shoulders. 
He tells the king about his will, uh, his willful, willfully ignoring and violating God's law. Elijah calls for a showdown on Mount Carmel that will prove the superiority of Jehovah over Baal. And the last question here says, when have you spoken boldly in the presence of fear? Okay, so now the meeting takes place. Elijah really is, he's not scared. Um, and he issues a challenge. And this is where we get into um, First Kings, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Y'all excuse me for a second because I'm, I'm turning pages. Um, later in First Kings, I think chapter 18, that's the duel uh, between Baal and God on the top of Mount Carmel. Okay. And so um, I won't go into for you can read that for yourself. Uh, probably one of the most interesting stories in the Bible. It really is to show the significant power of God um, and how, how Elijah prayed and fire came down from heaven um, and basically burnt, that, burnt a soaked altar. Um, not just soaked, um, minimally soaked. We're talking about uh, drenched over, uh, drenched over several times over. Um, and also a moat built around it that had water in it that was filled up and that uh, God sent fire from heaven after Elijah played, prayed and burned up the altar, sucked the water up, basically put a burnt spot where the offering was, boom, and, and the altar and the, and the sacrifice. And at that point, um, that's when Elijah said, look, we know who, we know who God is God now. And that's when all of the prophets of Baal were executed uh, and killed um, uh, because of uh, the standpoint of what happened right there in Mount Carmel. That's what read, you read a little bit later. But there's a boldness in presence of the presence of uh, in the midst of fear to have the aspect of boldness. And sometimes it is very difficult. However, for Elijah, the point had to be made that God is God. And so that overrode everything. So he, he kind of looked at it in a, in a way that, okay, I'm not scared of you, Ahab, because God controls me. Even if you were to take my life, God still has control over me. So um, I'm not worried about that. But he wanted to settle the score and said, look, at the end of the day, let's, have, let's go ahead and have um, this, uh, this challenge right now because y'all need to see that Baal isn't God. And that God truly is God. Uh, and he says, he says it, uh, that God has said, um, God has said who he says he is. And uh, he doesn't have to prove it, but this challenge will make it clear that he is the God of gods. He is the God of Israel. He is Yahweh. He is who you're supposed to worship. And that Baal is not a God at all. Okay? It takes courage to do that. Um, uh, in the midst of, of fear. Um, it takes a lot of courage to do that. And that's why Elijah is looked at as having courage because he was able to stand um, to Ahab and tell him, uh, yeah, you've been looking for me. Um, you've been looking for me, but now you found me. And I'm still telling you the same message that I told you before. Okay? The drought was caused not because of me. I was only the messenger. The drought was caused because you've been disobedient to God. And you fail to worship him. That's why the drought's happening. But we're going to settle this in Mount Carmel. And that's the, the, the further the furtherance of chapter 18 and first first our Kings that you can actually go to. So with that being said, the lesson is done for today. I thank God for your presence. I had a lot of people out there. We're up to about 20 folks today um, on our Sunday school lesson. Just thank God for you. Um, we will have our worship about 11 o'clock. Uh, I got to start getting things set up uh, for that. It will be through Facebook Live via Zoom. Um, uh, we have uh, Minister Anitra Hamilton. We had her at Mount, um, excuse me, we've had her at um, First Mount Zion before, uh, and she will be with us via our uh, Zoom, and she will be preaching for us on today. Um, give the pastor a little bit of a break, but also in two things. One, of course, is Palm Sunday today, so we want to let everyone know uh, that as we move toward um, uh, uh, Easter Sunday morning, which we are going to have a drive, our drive uh, Praise and Park worship uh, on next Sunday at the campus at First Mount Zion. So please come. 
uh, driving to your cars. We're not going to be in the building. We're actually going to be outside. So uh, please come up and uh, worship with us uh, on that day. We'll have all the information out for you. But um, I think this will be a good prelude towards that. And this is the last Sunday of Women's History Month. So uh, it was a good thing to be able to uh, that I could get Sister, uh, Minister Nietzsche Hamilton on our schedule to actually have her preach for the day, which uh, I wanted to do. I actually wanted to do it two Sundays, uh, last Sunday and this Sunday. Um, but the other minister that I was trying to get, unfortunately, um, she had a scheduling conflict and she couldn't she couldn't do it. So I was trying to do it for the, for the past two weeks. But we did get Minister Nietzsche Hamilton and we will be hearing the word of God from her on today. So please join us back on Facebook Live. We'll be at 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock, because we got to get things set up for that worship experience. So thank God for you. We're going to have and close out in prayer right now as the pastor will get things set up for our virtual beginning, beginning at 11 a.m. on today. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you and praise you, Lord, for this lesson of the courage of Elijah, God, and uh, knowing that we should have courage and be bold, O oh Lord, in the midst of um, any fears that we may have or trepidations. We ask, Father, that you lead us and guide us through uh, what has been spoken and said in this word and give us what we need for the journey of life. Thank you, Lord, for what we've experienced on today and give us what we need as we continue to travel down this highway of life. Bless us now and keep us in every way. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, I'm Pastor Hagwood, Reverend Eshawn Hagwood, pastor of First Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church in Charlotte, North Carolina, where we are exalting Christ to restore, renew, and rebuild people to serve the kingdom of God. God's blessings to you. Take care. Please join us at 11 a.m. Uh, on this Facebook page in order to uh, have our virtual worship on today. God's blessings to you. Take care. Be blessed.